Annyeong! Welcome to Delightful! Us three Pokémon loving doll makers are back for a sequel to our legendary Pokémon collaboration. When it comes to famous Pokémon trios, there's plenty more to choose from and I'm sure all of these would make great dolls. But... We couldn't all come to a decision on any of the well-known trios, so you know what? We decided to keep it simple and fun and create our favorite Pokémon. Three trainers from around the world, from different regions, if you will, brought together through our mutual love of the franchise. I can practically see us in an anime series, traveling across the land, gathering our gym badges, and completing our trials. After I show you how I made Sil Valley, be sure to head over to my fellow trainers' channels to see how they made their Pokémon. Diana's put together an adorable origin story for us, and Natalie is working her stop-motion magic as usual, so you won't want to miss those. Alright, let's get started. Naturally, it was difficult for any of us to choose just one favorite Pokémon. If you're like me, you've got about 10 or more top choices. However, one of my most recent faves comes from the Pokémon Sun and Moon games. We're introduced to a boy named Gladion and his mysterious companion Type Null, whose storyline we see through to the end of the game, where it eventually evolves into Sil Valley. There's a lot of reasons I love Sil Valley. Because the Pokémon looks like it's made up of multiple animals, I immediately thought of the Wingding Dilly by Bill Peet. That took me back. Second, I'm an absolute sucker for any and all mysterious and powerful characters with tortured backstories and serious personalities. Maybe it's a total cliché, but what can I say? Thirdly, if you've played the games and read the Pokédex entries, you'll know that Type Null only evolves into Sil Valley through high friendship, where it breaks free of its head restraint and embraces its full potential. I find this particularly poignant because you can interpret it to have a very positive message. Only through love and friendship can one overcome a painful and difficult past and evolve into the true version of themselves who's capable of anything. And lastly, it looks cool. Also, during a Pokemon card opening video, I mentioned how if I got a Sil Valley card then I'd make the doll? Well, since then, Natalie did send me a Sil Valley card, so I gotta do it now. Let's take a look at the concept art. Picking up on Sil Valley's nightly design, I sketched up this artwork. I watch my husband play a lot of Dark Souls and Monster Hunter, so I'm sure you can see the influence as those games were on my mind. I'm going for a powerful and mysterious fantasy knight kind of vibe. To help myself break down the components of his outfit and armor into pieces, I also took the time to draw up a rough draft of how all the layers will work together. As usual, things change a bit as I make the actual doll. I'll be using Ever After High's Dexter Charming doll as a base for this project. To make the body look bigger and put an emphasis on his clothing and armor, I'll be shrinking the head. To the work table! Heat up the vinyl and tug the head off over the neck peg to remove it. I've no need for Dexter's hair, so off it comes. Fill up a glass jar with enough acetone to encompass the head, pop it inside, and let the head soak for two hours. For a more in-depth guide on doll head shrinking, check the links below in the description box. Sometimes I don't know whether to call my office a workroom or a laboratory. 24 hours later, after the head has dried, I compare it to an original Dexter. Looks like the change wasn't very pronounced, so I put him back into the bath for another two shrinking sessions. It's time to remove it from the acetone. I was a little too rough here and ended up ripping the delicate vinyl in multiple places around his head, but it'll be fine probably. Here he is! After three acetone baths, we finally achieved a noticeable difference. There is notable damage all over the head, which is totally my fault, but luckily none of it happened on his face. Let's make his outfit! To make his black shirt, I use existing Ever After High Boys clothes to rough out the general pattern pieces. It will take some modifying and guesswork, but it's easier than starting from scratch. Add back in the seam allowance. I generally give about a 4 to 5 millimeter allowance. I add a sleeve piece and modify the pattern pieces until I think they're roughly in the ballpark of my design. It's always worth holding up or pinning on the pieces as you go to see what needs adjusting. Cut out the fabric pieces and stitch them together. He's also going to have leggings, so I lay the doll on a fresh piece of paper and trace the legs. I add a generous seam allowance, then fold the paper in half to cut it out symmetrically. I cut out two layers of the legging piece and sew them up around the perimeter. I largely overestimated how wide they need to be, but at least with clothes it's always easier to take in the size. 
So with a little pinning and marking, I can make the shape fit tightly to his legs. Not bad. Tight-fitting outfits are generally the hardest to make because there is little room for error, although using stretchy fabric helps. However, somehow his pants got a little too tight around the booty, and this awkward gap happened, so we'll just cover that up. The iconic cape was very easy to make. I sketched out front and back pieces, cut them out on the fold using cotton fabric, sewed the side seams, and cut out all the notches using the pattern to keep them even. And instead of hemming the edges, I sealed them with glue. Not only is this vastly easier, but it keeps the edge looking crisp and sharp. I added a slit down the back and I clasp for closure. I'll be using craft foam and heat to form his armor, and if you want a more in-depth video about these techniques, I've got something you can watch later. We've got a full suit of armor to make. Whew, let's do it. Like the clothes, I start with a rough paper pattern. The more accurate the better, but you'll see in a moment that we can push and mold the foam to an extent, so the pattern pieces aren't as vital here. When you figure the shapes are close enough, go ahead and cut them out of foam. Here are all the pieces I came up with. Now for the fun and dangerous part. Heating up and reshaping the craft foam. Light a candle and hold a piece over the flame. When you can feel it starting to get soft and wobbly, remove it from the flame and bend, press, or pull it as it cools. Be careful not to burn yourself, and make sure you don't hold the foam over the flame for too long and melt it. Also, wear a mask and open a window because burning foam fumes can't be good for you. Woo! First pass on the armor is done. With all the main shapes realized into 3D, we can start to hone the details using other materials. For his shoes, I take a needle and thread and sew on the soles. For raised detail, take puffy paint or fabric paint and draw on whatever designs you want. Fabric paint tends to dry flatter than when you apply it, so I usually do two or three passes. Silvalli has two green arms, but I wanted a more asymmetrical design, and I thought having different armor on one arm was in line with the Pokemon's multiple animal amalgamation theme. So it's like his suit of armor was assembled from different sources. The symbol I'm drawing here is the Pokemon Sun logo, which is the game I played for this generation. As well as sewing pieces together, foam also glues fairly well. So I glue on the fin on his elbow armor, and the spikes on his other arm, as well as a design element on the chest armor. That's a lot of tiny pieces! The last step before painting them is connecting the articulated pieces. I do this by first creating flat-headed pins, basically, out of wire. Then we can poke the pins through the armor, trim the excess, and curl back the sharp end with a pair of pliers. I do this on either side of the knee pieces, at the ankles, and at the elbow armor. Hide the pin's head with a well-placed design element. As long as one side of the pin is free, it can still swivel back and forth. Sew fabric straps to the pieces that need it, and attach snap closures. I love making armor fully removable, just in case it needs maintenance in the future. Plus, there's something charming about knowing each piece is functional and not just sculpted on, you know? All right, here's the armor after pass two. Time for paint. To prep the surface, I paint every piece with gesso. Yeah, this is black gesso. Pretty cool, huh? It's satisfying to see all the elements merge together as we unify everything with a single color. Up until this point, it looks pretty artsy craftsy, but once the paint goes on, it really does start to look like miniature armor. Next, I'll be using Golden Brand Metallic Acrylics to add shiny silver to the armor. I briefly considered making this doll in its shiny color palette, which is gold. I was actually gifted a beautiful shiny Silvalli from my fellow YouTuber pal Pimp Knight, so I felt justified in making the shiny since I legit owned one myself, but in the end I decided the original colors are knightlier and more recognizable. Yeah, I just wanted to show off my shiny Silvalli.
Much of the armor is metallic black, so I mixed some black acrylic paint into the silver to make the shine darker and more subtle. After a rough pass just to block out the color, I come back with a tiny brush to neaten up the edges. And then come in with color. I was hoping the silver underpainting would shine through the green acrylic paint. Or maybe micro glitter will help make it look like green metal. But it wasn't quite the right color, so I had to abandon that method and simply hand paint it to resemble shiny metal. I used tones and shades of green to mimic a shiny metallic surface. Not super convincing, but it looks alright I guess. Water down some black acrylic paint and wash all the silver pieces. The black seeps into the crevices and makes the metal look aged. If you go overboard, you can dab a dry cloth on top. And we can't forget battle damage! Take a blade and scratch up all the armor pieces. I try to think about how an enemy's weapon might have struck Sil Valley and at what angle the blow would have come from. He needs giant claws. Just like in my drawing, I want his clawed gauntlet hands to be massive, so we're going to use our favorite two-part epoxy sculpt to modify his hands. Rough up the plastic with sandpaper to give the medium a texture to stick to, then start building up the new hand shape. I wanted his claws so much bigger than the originals that the original hands more or less became an armature for the sculpture. The hands went through about five passes of epoxy. One layer needed to completely harden before I applied the next. Because the fingers are so close together, it was easy to make a mistake and squish a finger by accident, so being patient and waiting for the previous layer to cure was key here. They got long enough where I did eventually embed a wire for support, just in case. A couple more details, and they're finished. One hand is relaxed and one is curved. The curved hand will be the one that grasps his sword. Like all the other pieces, his hands get a coat of gesso and paint. And then I cover all the pieces with varnish to protect the paint job. If you're curious, all the materials I use in this video are listed below in the description box. Now for his skirt, or what would you call that, armored kilt? I sketch a to scale blueprint for size reference, then get out my air dry clay to form these pieces. The air dry clay is lightweight, so hopefully this will keep the belt from becoming too heavy and falling down. The shorter pieces were fine on their own, but I figured the longer pieces could use some supportive wire. Once they're dry, whittle off any excess and sand away fingerprints. Then with epoxy sculpt, I add the diamond shaped scales to every piece. They'll be strung together with embroidery threads, so each piece needs two holes drilled through them at the top. And you guessed it, like everything else, we need to cover the pieces with a layer of gesso and then acrylic paint. I've noticed that if you paint an entire object one solid color, it can look amateur, so I've added a subtle gradient from blue to indigo. To form the fin between the two tail pieces, I trace and cut out the shape from a thin, flexible plastic. I want to call this cellophane, but I can't be certain what this material is called. I paint the design onto the edge, wait for that to dry, and then attach the fin to the tail pieces with hot glue. Now we can string them all together. I draw on a couple guides for myself, then weave it through the holes just like I'm sewing. Thread number two goes through the top holes and feeds through the mini fin like this. Now we just gather the fins like we're making a ruffle. I'm hoping this will give it some volume and drama. Hmm, needs more drama. There, three tiers looks perfect. We can now use his new tiny head as a basis to mold the craft foam on. Yes, it's finally time to make the most iconic attribute of this character, his helmet. I'm going to try this with my thinnest 3mm craft foam to minimize size. Even though I've gone through the effort of shrinking his head, I'm still afraid that his helmet will turn out too large and turn my serious character into a cute chibi version of himself. 
but I'll do my best. Hmm, I think a piece shaped like this will work. It took some finessing, but eventually I got the two halves to look symmetrical. Ish. Like with his shoes, I stitch pieces of the helmet together and make small cuts and adjustments on the fly as I try to seamlessly connect the pieces. The rounded head portion was the most difficult part, so I was relieved when that shape was formed. From there on, it was a simple matter of sketching a paper mock-up, cutting it out of foam or cardstock paper, and sewing slash gluing it to the helmet. The jaw piece is cardstock paper with a wire sewn through it, if you couldn't tell from the photo. Now, my plan was to bolt the jaw in place, but now that I've made the helmet, I'm worried that we can't afford the space of a nut inside the helmet. So instead, I'm going to employ the use of very thin magnets. I carve out a seat for the magnets on the inside of the helmet so that they'll be flush with the rest of the structure. I set it in place with glue and add a protective covering of paper because these magnets are pretty strong and I don't want them to pull each other out of place. While I've got the magnets out, I'm sure the helmet has a better chance of staying on the doll's head if it's magnetically attached too. So let's go ahead and place a big magnet in the center of the helmet and another on the crown of the doll's head. With the structure complete, it's time to fancify his helmet. Still wanting to keep it as lightweight as possible, I'll be going in with more air dry clay to sculpt the details. Let's start by thickening the paper ears and applying a thin smearing of clay into the crevices to completely hide the stitches from the needle and thread. Flush out the axe-like shape on top, fill in the gaps near the nose, cover up more of the stitches, etc. I use clay to tidy up the jaw's shape as well, and sculpt on the characteristic fangs. On the second pass, I build up an edge on the fin to create the illusion that these are separate pieces. I also sculpt around the forehead to create the indent in front of his ear, and lastly form the triangle on the nose. Can't forget about the eye holes. After everything dries, we sand down the surface like always, but instead of going straight to gesso, I felt the need to paint on a coat of glue. This was my first time putting air dry clay on top of craft foam, and although it was holding on well, the generous glue layer provided me with some assurance that everything will stay together. This is when I finally put the other magnets on the jaw. There we go. Now we can cover the helmet with gesso and get to painting. After sitting back and re-evaluating my concept art, I realized I wanted the helmet to have a more light gray color to match the tunic. I didn't think the silver paint I'd been using until now would look right. I did try it out briefly, but somehow it just didn't look like Sil Valley. I like the lighter color of the helmet compared to the straight out of the tube silver that I used to paint the other armor. Hmm. Now I'm rethinking my paint choices for the rest of his armor. I already finished that armor, but I love the lighter look so much more, I've gotta change it. It feels more like the Pokemon and has a fantasy anime vibe to it, whereas the straight up silver looked very realistic. Does that make sense? I had to go through the effort again, but I know I'd regret it if I didn't. Anyway, back to the helmet. Painting on the red ear inset was fun. It's such an eye-grabbing accent color. The mask portion gets darker gray and the innermost area of his ears is painted black. Now, I know what you're thinking. There's some obvious parts of the helmet that are missing. We'll come back to that. For now, let's focus on his face up. Dexter's got a great face mold, no doubt, but it's not quite what I imagine a human version of Silvalli to look like. So alter it, I shall. Shrunken doll heads are harder than their original forms, so it makes putting on epoxy alterations a breeze. I widen his nose and make it pointier. And I also apply a tiny amount to the corners of his mouth to change his expression from smiling to neutral. Oh yeah, and those ears? The helmet is a tight fit as is, so I'm thinking everything will fit better without them. Cut down the neck peg before heating up the head and reinstalling it to his neck. If you don't shorten the length, the shrunken head might not fit back on. The new head size matches pretty well. The neck looks a little long, but he'll be wearing a turtleneck. I paint a couple layers of gesso over his face to prepare the surface, 
and then bring him outside to my makeshift airbrushing studio, which is this box. I used a mixture of the colors you see on screen now. These are from the Vallejo brand Game Air Paint Series. Since I bothered setting this up, I thought I might as well try blushing the face using the airbrush too. Not bad. Once the paint fully dries, give him one or two coats of Mr. Super Clear sealant. 30 minutes later, we can draw on his face. Now looking at the Pokemon here, we see that the default Sil Valley has neutral gray eyes. There's already an awful lot of gray on this doll, so I'm going to intentionally make his eyes red, which is Sil Valley's accent color. The Pokemon's eyes actually can turn red in the game as well, but I'll talk more about that later. Using a light blue pencil which barely shows up on camera, I make some initial marks that will help me place the eyes evenly. Then I outline the eyebrows and begin drawing the shapes of his eyes. Because Sil Valley was cooked up in a lab and is literally the synthetic Pokemon, I want my doll to have a neutral, almost robotic gaze. As I color the eyes, I'm drawing on variations of the color red in streaks around his pupil. The idea was to make his irises resemble CDs, which pays homage to the items you use on Sil Valley in the games. I fill in his eyebrows using a cool gray. And dab on his lip color. For the finishing touches, I darken the lash line and give him a couple lashes. Then using a white pencil, I highlight his eyelids, the corner of his eye, and under the eyebrow. Around this time, I needed a fresh coat of sealant, so I did that and came back. On this fresh layer, I dust pastels over the lips to help bring out more color, and use more of that white gesso in his eyes and to do highlights. After his last coat of sealant, use a high gloss varnish to make the eyes and lips shiny. Just like last time I shrunk a doll head, I've waited too long and missed the window of opportunity to do a reroute. My excuse this time? I had to order hair specifically for him and wait for it to come in the mail. So we'll be gluing it on once again. I really wanted to match my concept art and find this very specific shade of light desaturated sky blue. And I finally found it on dollyhair.com. Take chunks of the doll hair and paint glue onto the middle of each section. I made a whole bunch of these and once they were dry, I peeled them off the bag, cut them in half, and voila, hair wefts. Work your way around the skull, going from bottom to top, angling your wefts and gluing them down at the appropriate angle. I haven't reached the top yet in this shot, but I suddenly remembered a useful technique. I saw Moonlight Jewel do it in her Easter doll video. As she glued on each row of hair, she immediately ironed it down so that it would lay flat. That way, she didn't need to do any messy boil washing at the end. Well, I don't have a tiny doll iron, but I do have a straightener and a butter knife, and that's basically the same thing. Heat up the knife and use the flat surface to shape the hair down. Make sure you test this out on a separate hair chunk first, because not all synthetic hairs can take this kind of heat. Now we've made it to the top. You can see I've surrounded the magnet. To form the part using glue wefts, stick down a nice thick weft on the far side of the part like this. Once that's thoroughly dry, flip the hair all the way over and iron that sucker flat. It took me a couple passes, but I eventually convinced it to lay down. Then you do the same thing to the other side. The hardest part is making sure this last weft is nice and snug against the previous one. You don't want a big gap between the two of them when you flip it over. There we go! You can't even see the magnet under there. That finishes his face and hair. Alright, back to the armor one last time. His helmet is still missing a couple objects. The characteristic feathers and that gizmo thing that looks like a bolt. We also haven't tackled his sword yet. This is where the project gets a little ambitious, so buckle up! We're about to dive into resin and electronics once again! Wish me luck! So yes, the feathers and sword need to have LED lights embedded in them and be made out of clear resin so that they light up. If I can pull this off, it's gonna be awesome. 
First things first, I need to sculpt a positive shape in which to take a mold of. Yes, I actually made these earlier, but sometimes in order to group parts together to make a good video, the chronological continuity of the footage gets messed up, so just excuse that, please. The feather shape was pretty easy. I encased an armature wire in epoxy sculpt and smoothed it out as it cured. The sword, on the other hand, took some trial and error. The first thing I did was print out a perfectly symmetrical blueprint of the sword. Then I used Sculpey Clay to delicately recreate the design into 3D. I felt like an idiot for using such a grabby surface to sculpt the sword on, because I couldn't transfer it to the tin foil without breaking it. But after patching it up, I baked it, and it came out fairly decent. However, even after sanding and sanding, I had doubts that I could ever get the blade portion of it completely flat and smooth, which is why I ended up cutting out a strip of packaging and gluing it on top. Surely this surface will create a flat and shiny mold. I also formed the helmet gizmo out of epoxy. Once all the positives are ready and sanded as smooth as I could get them, it's time for the next phase, creating the negative. I'm using silly gum molding paste, and much like the epoxy, it's a two-part mix that cures quickly. Mix it up, and press it onto the positive. Same thing for the little gizmo. Honestly, I could have just made two of these out of epoxy, but I wanted the resin practice. And lastly, the feather, which needs to stand up vertically. I gently encase it into the putty, trying to seal in the shape without air bubbles. Stand it upright and generously widen the top, which is actually the base of the feather so that we have plenty of room to pour our resin. How'd we do? Well, I can already see that I missed some areas on the sword, so I mix up a little more putty to patch those. Now we can remove the positives. For the feather, this means cutting the mold all the way down one side. For the others, it's a simple case of popping it out. Cool! And look, the plastic packaging did create a smooth surface in the mold, yes! The LEDs need to be embedded in the final pieces, remember, so before I pour the resin, we need to bust out the soldering gun. The Pokemon Sil Valley's whole gimmick is that its typing can change based on the item you give it. So it could be a fire type, water type, electric, grass, you name it. When you change its type, the color of its feathers, tail, and eyes change as well. Since this is Sil Valley's whole deal, I knew there was only one option for what LEDs to use. Multicolor. These are 5mm LEDs with a slow multicolor changing function. I prepare each LED with a positive and negative wire using my soldering gun and heat shrink tubing. Now we're ready for resin. I'll be using two part resin. Mix it up, add a touch of silver glitter, and pour. Mix in some more sparkles, and now we can embed the light. Thankfully, I have a doodad that will hold the LED in place. And now the gizmo. And the sword. This resin claims to cure in about 24 hours, so I leave these molds untouched and buy an open window for a whole day and a half. And then at last, we can wiggle the resin pieces free, which is honestly the best part. Here comes the feather, fingers crossed. Yes, it looks so good! I was unsure how the sword would come out because of the long, thin blade, but it did really well too. I was surprised and pleased at how lightweight the resin was, because this means the doll should have no problem holding the sword. All the pieces need a little cleaning up and buffing around the edges, but other than that I'm really happy. We're not done though. I still need to cast two more feathers and the other side of the sword's handle. For the sword, I use the same mold but just block off the blade portion, and embed an LED into the hilt with a shallow layer of resin. A while later, after that's cured enough, I top it off with one last resin pour. I did this to make sure the LED is submerged and doesn't float up as the resin cures. Fast forward in time once more, and we can free the last resin pieces. Now to join the handle part.
I turn to magnets again as a solution for how he'll hold the sword. Thankfully, his chunky hands hide the magnets really well. I give the hilt of the sword its paint job, which hides the ugly wiring out of sight. Well, most of it. My plans on how to make the sword changed several times as I was creating it, which is how we ended up with this wire sticking out here. If I had planned ahead better, I'm sure I could have made this less unsightly. When it comes to the circuitry, it's easier to show you a diagram of how I did it rather than the real deal. I'm still a newbie when it comes to circuits, so my work is a bit messy. The three feather LEDs are on a parallel circuit, which connects to a battery hidden inside the back of the helmet. And check this out, it's a rechargeable helicopter drone battery, so it's tiny and powerful, just what we need. Big shout out to Dad Lightful for all the help with the electronics. I stab a hole and pass the wire through, which will connect to the battery hidden inside this compartment here. And slide the feathers into place. The sword and tail LEDs will be on the same circuit and work like so. This time the battery hides behind his cape on his back, and the cables travel down his back to light the tail, and then all the way around and down his arm to meet the sword. Let's see a test run. And with that, Silvalli is finished. This was the first time I felt that I successfully used molds and resin and electronics, so I'm very proud that I pulled this off. I think we can all agree that his helmet is the coolest doll prop I've ever made. If I could go back and change anything, I'd make that cable less obvious on the sword. And if I could have made the helmet smaller, I would have. The head shrinking helped, but he still looks a little chibi-esque. But overall, I'd call him a resounding success in my book. My mom came to visit just as I finished this doll, so she helped me out during the photo shoot, and kept calling Sil Valley Sylvester because she couldn't remember his name. And now I'm thinking we need to nickname him Sylvester. Don't forget, there are two more Pokemon videos waiting for you over on the Doll Fairy and Doll Motions channels. 
One of the many reasons I love working with these two is that we have such different styles from each other. I'm always surprised and delighted to see how other artists interpret a subject, especially when it's different from what I imagined. Diana has spoiled us with not one, but two Sylveons done in a very opulent 19th century style, while Natalie has gone full kawaii decora with her female Pikachu doll. So give my friends a visit, like the video if you're proud of me for finally making a decent circuit, and I'll catch you next time. Stay artsy! Annyeong!